In this lecture, you'll learn about Fibre Channel, which is the original SAN protocol, so it's the best place to start learning about SAN. All the other SAN protocols that came after Fibre Channel borrow a lot of the same characteristics, so it really helps if you understand Fibre Channel first. There's quite a bit to it, so I'm going to break it down into three separate lectures, and we'll start here talking about FCP, the Fibre Channel Protocol, and Fibre Channel Addressing, which uses WWPNs. The first thing to learn about SANS is the terminology. We covered in the earlier lecture what NAS and SAN are. NAS is file level access, and SAN is block level access, meaning the client that is accessing the SAN storage, it appears to be accessing a hard drive directly. When you configure the storage on the storage system for the client, you create a LUN. That stands for logical unit number. And that represents a disk that's going to be presented to the host. And it appears to the host just the same as a local hard drive inside its own chassis. LUNs are specific to SAN protocols. We don't have LUNs with NAS. The next thing is the initiator and the target. When we're using the correct terminology, the client of the storage system is known as the initiator and the storage system itself is known as the target. Okay, now we've got the terminology down, let's start learning about Fibre Channel. So Fibre Channel is the original SAN protocol. It's been around a long time, but it's still very popular today. You still see it being used a lot. It uses dedicated adapters, cables, and switches, and it's different than Ethernet at all layers of the OSI stack all the way down to the physical level. So it uses cards, which are called HBAs, host bus adapters, and they look very like normal Ethernet network cards, but they're different. And it uses switches across the network, but we use fiber channel switches. They look like Ethernet switches, but again, they're different. Fiber channel is different than Ethernet at every level. When we're using fiber channel, it uses FCP. That is the fiber channel protocol, and that's used to send SCSI commands over the fiber channel network. And it's the SCSI commands that are controlling the reads and writes going to the disk at the low level. One of the reasons that fiber channel is still used a lot today is it's a very stable and reliable protocol. It's lossless, unlike TCP and UDP, which are used to run over our Ethernet networks. So it's more stable, more reliable than Ethernet networks in general. It supports bandwidths of 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, and 128 gigabits per second. Now, it didn't always, when it first came out, it was 1 gigabits per second, and then as time went on, two became available, then four, then eight, and so on. So if you've got a fiber channel network, it's not necessarily going to support all of these different speeds. This is the latest that's available now, but to have all those different speeds available on your network, you would need to be running the latest hardware. Okay, so fiber channel networks, this is the architecture of them. With the diagram here, you see that we've got a client at the top and then server one. So for this example, it's going to be server one that is using the SAN storage. But I want to give you the complete picture here. So let's say that server one's client, let's say that that is you at your desk on your PC and server one is a web server and you're going to be accessing some web pages on the web server. So you sit down on your desktop PC, you connect over your normal corporate ethernet network network to server one. Then when your request for the web page hits server one, it's going to fetch that from its storage, which is available on the remote storage system over the fiber channel SAN. So for the fiber channel SAN, that uses separate physical infrastructure. It does, cannot run over an ethernet network. It's completely different. It's a fiber channel network. So you see on server one, 
it's got its fiber channel HBA. The HBA is a host bus adapter. It's basically the equivalent of an Ethernet NIC network card. That is connected with a fiber channel cable to a fiber channel switch. And then the storage system also has its fiber channel HBAs and it's connected to the switched fiber channel network as well. So putting it all together, your normal client is going to connect to the server over a normal Ethernet network, and then the server connects to its storage to fetch the data for the client over the fiber channel SAN. The addressing that is used by fiber channel is WWNs. That stands for World Wide Name. WWNs are 8-byte addresses made up of 16 hexadecimal characters. So you can see on the slide here an example of a WWN. It's a great big long address, so I'm not going to read out the whole thing. You can see it there. That's the kind of format that it takes. The WWN and Worldwide node name is assigned to a node in the storage network. So we've got our Worldwide names, our WWNs, there's two types of them. There's the Worldwide node names, that's the WWNN, and there's the Worldwide port name, the WWPN, that we'll get onto in a second. So the WWNN, the Worldwide node name, that is assigned to a node in the storage network. For example, a server or an HBA on the storage system. The same WWNN can identify multiple network interfaces of a single network node. So it identifies the node or the HBA as a whole. We could have a, a multi-port HBA in our server, for example. A different WWPN, Worldwide Port Name, is assigned to every individual port on a node. So we could have a node which has got two ports in it. It would have a single WWNN and it would have two WWPNs. So the WWPN is assigned to the physical interface on the node. A multi, so like I just said, a multi-port HBA will have different WWPNs on each port. WWPNs are the equivalent of MAC addresses in Ethernet. They're very similar. The WWPN, just like the MAC address in Ethernet, is burned in by the manufacturer and guaranteed to be globally unique. So you do not need to manually configure the WWPN. When you get the HBA from the factory, it's already got the WWPN burned into it by the manufacturer. And they've got a system of naming to make sure that these names are always going to be globally unique. No HBA in the whole world is going to have a duplicate WWPN on there. WWPNs are assigned to HBAs on both the clients and the storage system as well. So both the, the clients, like your normal servers, and the storage systems are endpoints on your fiber channel network, and they all need to have WWPNs to be able to communicate with each other. We're primarily concerned with WWPNs, not WWNNs, when we're configuring fiber channel networks. When we're doing the configuration on the fiber channel switches and on the storage system as well, we're going to set it up so that only the correct client or the connect initiator can connect to the correct LUN on the storage. For example, if you've created a LUN for an Exchange server and a LUN for a SQL server as well, you don't want the Exchange server connecting into the SQL server by accident. It could corrupt the storage. Obviously, that would be a security concern as well. Okay, so that's our WWPNs. You'll learn more about how the actual communication works over those WWPNs in the next lecture. Okay, so you saw that those WW ends are great big long addresses and you do have to configure your switches and your storage system to point at them so it's not very convenient to do that a way we can make it more convenient is by configuring aliases for example if we've got that exchange server and it's wwpn is that great big long address you can see in the middle here we can create an alias for it where we call it exchange server 
one for HBA1, for example. And then on our storage system and our fiber channel switches later, we can reference it by the alias rather than the big WWPN. This is really convenient. It makes it less likely that we're going to put any typos in there or any misconfigurations. And also for troubleshooting later, when we're actually viewing what's going on, we can view them by alias so we can see which server or storage system we're talking about rather than having to figure it out by its WWPN. Just makes things a lot easier for us. And your aliases can be configured both on your switches and on the storage system as well. Okay, so that's it for the WWPN addresses and also our first intro to Fiber channel. We'll get into some more detail in the next lecture.